Okay, uh, it's just after uh, two o'clock, so we'll get started. Uh, my name is Bernie Daigle, and I look, I look after uh, knowledge transfer uh, for the Atlantic Forestry Centre. Uh, bonjour tout le monde, uh, je m'appelle Bernard Daigle, puis je m'occupe du transfert de connaissances pour le centre de foresterie de l'Atlantique. Avant de commencer, j'aimerais souligner quelques remarques d'ordre administratif. Uh, before starting, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping notes. Uh, as was stated in the email invitation, today's presentation will be in English. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and uh, the recording will be made available to the participants. Uh, the presentation slides and the questions and answers will also be available to the participants uh, in both French and English. Tel uh, indiqué dans le courriel d'invitation, cette présentation sera donnée en anglais. Uh, le webinaire uh, sera enregistré et disponible aux participants. Les diapos de la présentation ainsi que les questions et réponses seront aussi disponibles euh, en français et en anglais. Nous vous demandons d'utiliser l'icône de questions-réponses pour, pour poser vos questions. Euh, les questions peuvent être posées soit en anglais ou en français, mais nous allons attendre jusqu'à la fin de la présentation pour répondre aux questions. Euh, we ask that you use the question and answer button at Uh, to ask your question. This is located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the questions may be asked in English or in French, uh, but we'll wait until after the presentation is over to answer the questions. I'll now pass it over to uh, Donnie McPhee. Uh, Donnie is coordinator of the uh, National Tree Seed Center, and he'll be giving today's presentation. Uh, je vais maintenant passer la parole à Donnie McPhee. Uh, Donnie est coordinateur du Centre national de semences forestières et va donner la présentation d'aujourd'hui. So, uh, Donnie, uh, it's all yours. Great. Well, thank you, Bernie. Um, yeah, so welcome to this second of a series of seminars geared to those looking for support in areas related to the seed supply chain of forest trees and shrub seeds. As Bernie mentioned, I'm Donnie McPhee, and I'm the coordinator here at the National Tree Seed Center, which is located on the East Coast out here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, and resides on the traditional lands off the Lewistoquay First Nation. While we're doing this um, in support of the two billion trees, uh, we also just want to assure you that knowledge exchange is you know, part of our mandate and it's not just restic restricted to those obtaining funding. So if you uh, need any information, even though you're not part of the 2B entry program, we're still open for business and to support you. Okay. There we go, good. So while we are physically located on the traditional lands of the Lewis Cray, we also want to acknowledge that we conduct our work activities on treaty lands and territories of numerous and in diverse Indigenous nations and pay tribute to their heritage and legacy. As a national center, we try to work from sea to sea to sea in this great country of ours. This second of a series of seminars is aimed to support small to medium-sized enterprises, communities, regional collaborators, and those looking to start or increase their capacity regarding seed collection, processing, storage, in particular at this time, those that are looking to become involved in the Two Billion Tree Program. We're gonna post link to the first seminar that we conducted last month, last month on uh, small scale equipment needs. Um, and then as Bernie said, we can follow up with the recording resources, answers to the question and answering documents uh, for anyone who's registered for the uh, seminars or also anyone who signs up for our National Tree Seed Center newsletter, uh, where we also will have uh, training videos associated with the steps involved in the seed supply chain. And this brings us to our first set of polling questions. So answering these questions will help us identify the best way to support you moving forward. While you're looking at that, I also wanted to mention that anyone who's involved in the Two Billion Tree Program, you'll notice that in all the calls of pro for proposals, there hasn't been a call proposals for seed collection. Uh, but I was given permission to let you know that there is exploratory work 
being done currently on the potential call for proposals on seed collections. Um, and hopefully by our next seminar, uh, I'll know more and be able to fill you in on that. So again, I see uh, the first question is, are you planning on applying for funding? And if, if so, what stream? And then the second question will pop up and it's just, um, what areas are you considering being involved in? Good. So before we get into the presentation, and again, uh, we're hoping that these seminars sort of link together because I don't want to repeat, but for this time, we're just going to go uh, the evolving mandate of the National Tree Seed Center for those who don't know anything about us. Um, again, the Seed Center was established in 1967 in Petawawa, Ontario. And at that time, it was really on focused on, on obtaining, storing, and providing native Canadian tree seed of known origin, and that's the important part, for research purposes. It was in these early years that the CFS, along with the National Tree Seed Center, worked with our provincial seed centers and their collaborators to develop the tree breeding programs that are still in place today. And indeed, much of the seed used by our industrial forest sector comes from these well-established programs that are run by our provinces. In 1996, the center moved to Fredericton, New Brunswick, and this coincided with uh, new commitments by our federal government to the uh, like things like the Convention of Forest Biodiversity and the Federal Species at Risk Act. And that really changed or added to our mandate because now we were looking at being uh, working with conservation issues. And also we started including shrubs um, at that time. Um, and a lot of our conservation issues were to do with genetic resources that were under threat by invasive pest pathogens and climate change. So we've been in existence for over 50 years, and we really feel that we've gained a lot of expertise in the collection and distribution of seed for research, and also in collaborating with conservation and recovery programs, along with innovations in small scale seed handling, testing and storage protocols. Now with the announcement of the 2 billion tree program, we envision that there may be potential seed related gaps uh, regarding resources and training materials that might be available to people looking to become part of the program, now, I just want to point out that in different regions of the country, there's varying levels of expertise and support currently available. And what all we're trying to do is really uh, work with those organizations and fill in the gaps and uh, do our best to, to help out uh, in uh, providing the knowledge needed for a successful program. So this brings us to the topic of the day. Um, and in the 30 minutes coming up here, there's no way we could possibly dive into all the factors related to forecasting, field collections, transportation to processing facilities, cleaning and storage of, seed, of our spring cedars. But what this presentation is meant to do is give you an overview and then provide you and let you know that we're here as a resource to help you get through uh, whatever needs <laughs> that, that you might uh, come upon. Um, so the first slide here and things you need to be thinking about with the spring cedars is things like uh, the age of the trees and are the trees and the populations are from your region or the spots you identify collection, are they sexually mature? Um, and that really comes down to do you see seed on your trees? Um, most of our spring cedars only come into seed every two to seven years. So you're not going to get seed every year. So when you do see a good collection year, you really got to be planning to make hay when the sun shines, get that collections thinking three to five seasons out, make collections for the next three to five years. Um, some of the other things you want to be looking at is your crown size and position uh, of the trees. Again, a dense canopy crowns are going to be very hard to collect from. So if you can identify beforehand, uh, nice crowns that are kind of more in the open that you can make easy collections from, that's going to be much help you in the, in the long run. And then you gotta be thinking of some of the stressors uh, that might interfere with some of these early spring cedars, that things happen really quickly and we'll get into it where you know pollination happens and literally you have seed ready to be picked in four to six weeks. So a lot happens in a short period of time. So at the same time, a lot of things can go wrong. Um, one of the things, uh, this is sort of an example of, um, first of all, uh, this, these are all our spring cedars that we're talking about, our poplis, our willows, our maples, and our elm. And 
already, most of these have already seeded. And when you look at the start to the end for all our spring seeders, you're really looking at for the majority, you know, four, six, eight weeks and everything's done. So in that time period, you have to already do your forecasting, you have to do your collections, you have to do your, and have everything shipped and ready to go to your facilities in a very short period of time. So at the end of the program or the seminar, I'll talk about this because we can provide you, depending on where in the country you live, with more accurate um, mapping tools so you know when these seeders might be coming to seed in your region. So for some of the other things you really need to consider with, um, sorry, with uh, looking at wild stand collections. And again, we don't wanna be making collections from single trees. We really wanna maximize the genetic diversity of our collections for future uses. Um, and so that means a nice variety of trees from a wide area to make sure that we're getting good genetic diversity and a good mixture in our collections. Uh, your goal and how much you want to collect really depends on you know, what your um, long-term goals are. So our goal at the seed center is we like to have three to 5,000 seed per tree and then about 20 trees in a, in a, in a, in a given region. But again, that's for research and conservation purposes. For your purposes, you're probably looking at multiplying these factors by 10, 20, if you're looking to go into production forestry. For forecasting of your populace and aspen, uh, finding trees in seed is really what you should be looking for now. Uh, understand there's male and female trees, so don't be alarmed if only 50% of the trees in a stand are in seed, because the other 50% are probably female or male. Um, the first of the aspens of the poplars that comes in is trembling aspen. And one thing that's for all seed collection, I want to say here is that there's really not a lot of guessworking when it comes to collection of mature seed. Um, you can either ignore what the seed and its indicators are telling you and collect too early, or you can wait too long after the indicators are told you that they're right and then it's gonna to be too late and everything's gonna be gone. Again, things happen really quickly. There are visual cues that will indicate you, indicate to you where and when you should be collecting so you're doing it at the right time. And I know that's easier said than done when things are happening so fast. But in general, all mature seed will change color. The pods, the catkins will start to change color when they're ripe. So this is a uh, pop populous grandifolia, I think here. So again, nice and green, still probably too early. This is just another example of too late. The seed pods have already opened. But if you look up here, uh, this looks like tremeloides here, but the catkins are just starting to change from a dark green to a light yellow. And you're starting to see little fluff. And that's the indicator, time to collect. Okay, again, very short window. You can go from dark green to time to collect to empty in three to five days at times, or even quicker, depending if you get really hot weather. So you really have to keep an eye on stuff and go at it hard when it's ready. The willows are very, very similar, uh, similar indicators. Uh, this is Salix color here. Uh, Pussy willow is one of the first of the Salix ready. It's already all very close here in Frederick to New Brunswick. We've had a very warm spring. Um, but again, um, looking for those color changes um, in, your, uh, in your catkins. When it comes to the maples, again, looking for color change. So for our soft maples, we have red maple, silver maple, and then we have the hybrid, Asar Friedman, um, and which is naturally occurring in some areas, but it's also used uh, in our nurseries uh, for urban planting some areas. But again, you're looking for that seed to go from a dark green, just starting to change color. So this is almost a brownish red. And soon as you start to see the Samara change color, you know they're ready for collecting. Um, a couple of key things on the slide is just remember, um, they um, have um, double Samara on all of our maples. And in general, most times one of the Samara or seed is gonna be empty. So when you're making your collections, you might look like you have a lot of seed, but in your mind, you're thinking that 50% of this is empty to start with. So 
That's going to come in uh, when we get to our quantities in a little bit down the side. Now, I don't know how many people are actually looking to collect elm. I mean, Dutch elms is uh, really tough on our elm. Um, but we do have slippery elm as well. But if you are looking for uh, making collection of elm, it's the same thing. You're looking for that color change. So again, you're going to see these are still dark green. The leaves are still immature, meaning that they're probably not ready. As opposed to these are ripe seed. They're going to turn nice and brown. And you already see that they're not going to be mature until the leaves are fully elongated. That's another good indicator for you. You can see this circle here where uh, seed is already starting to break. So this is the time for collection. Again, at this stage up here, you can be doing some of your forecasting and you can be actually taking some and just feeling that seed between your fingers or ripping them open to make sure there actually is seed in, uh, uh, sorry, embryos in that seed. Um, yeah, so those are just some of the indicators you're looking for. We presented this um, in our first seminar, but it was the collection supply tools. And we can, again, provide this to anybody. Uh, anyone who's attending the seminar will, will provide this list. But specifically for spring seeding, um, you got to make sure you have breathable bags. And even your bins should be graded. Any boxes that you're using should be ventilated. Um, and before you even start making collections, you really have to start down, thinking down the road about when I make the collections, do I have a nice draft free room for spreading my poplar and willows? Because any draft is gonna have that fluff up in the air, unless you have containers that can hold it down that are still um, <clears throat> allow for ventilation. You have gotta be thinking of dehumidifiers, depending on what part of the country you are to lower the humidity. And then once you have it uh, extracted, to get it into your cooler. So again, even before you start collecting, these are all things you really need to be start thinking about. Um, and one thing with um, our poplars and willows is I know a lot of times it can be discouraging. You know, you travel two, 300 kilometers to make your collections, you get there, they're not quite ripe. I know that Anne um, and Kim with, um, out in Alberta with uh, Rose, Wild Rose, Wild Rose, Wild Rose. Wild Rose. Um, they've had quite a bit of success with taking branches and putting them in water uh, while they transport, which allows kind of an app after ripening. So that's something you can play around with. Again, when it comes to actually uh, collecting, again, we really tend to or aim to walk lightly and harvest with respect, understanding that if we find a good area to make collections, we probably want to come back there year after year. So we tend to, uh, whenever possible, use uh, pick from the ground from low-lying branches. Uh, we use pole pruners. Um, but if you are on crown land and if you have the proper permission and certification for cutting trees um, and you have a certified chainsaw operator, again, with poplars and willows, uh, most of them are clonal. So by taking down one heavy seed uh, tree, uh, you could probably collect, you know, over a million seed from one tree. Um, so again, depending on how much seed you need, we really find that, um, you know, taking three or four heavy branches that we can also get up to, you know, 500,000 seed from an individual tree. Uh, for salix, again, the obstacles are a little different. Uh, most of our salix you can collect from the ground using just hooks and lines uh, and hand picking, uh, stripping them into buckets and bags. Uh, for some of the larger willows, like black willow, I'm thinking, uh, pole pruners are very handy. Um, but again, um, some of the things you got to be careful for just when you're out there is where they grow. Again, a lot of the willow habitat is can be pretty treacherous for walking and getting around. Um, and then you have to be careful because it's shrubby. So when you're making collections, uh, secure those bags after you have them full. The last thing you want to have is your bags being ripped open by branches and stuff as you're walking through. And just an example, um, and we're going to get into this a little bit, but there was a study by Campbell um, up in uh, Northeastern Ontario, and they were shown to be able to collect about 187,000 pure seed in an hour. So pretty substantial. Uh, collections. For our maples and elms, uh, we encourage whenever possible to collect seed directly from the tree. 
So this helps in all the subsequent processing um, endeavors down the road. It helps eliminate, you know, picking up, up the undesirable dirt and ground material into your collection bags. Uh, it eliminates uh, possibility of collecting seed from other species. Or if you are looking for single tree collections of mixing up seed from different trees into one collection. And we'll talk about um, how this helps with keeping our purity levels high in upcoming slides. Um, but just a, a quick example, uh, we did a project with the Nashbach uh, Watershed Association uh, for maple last year. And I know from their records that they got about 80,000 viable seed. Um, and this is after grading. And it was about 170 liters of seed to get that 80,000 viable uh, seedlings in the ground. Another method that we use at times when uh, pole pruning, maybe the branches are too high, is a tarp and shake or tarp and break or tarp and cut method. All can be used for high branches. Uh, again, you'd set up tarps on the ground underneath the trees. Uh, and there's a little video here. And again, when you receive this PowerPoint, you can click on this as a live video. It's a three minute video that will explain this all out. Um, one of the things you really have to watch out for though is you can only really do this on calm days. Otherwise, as the seed falls, it's going to blow away. Um, and again, placement of your tarps is very important because you use it on high branches. And if a branch falls from that high up, when it hits the ground and the seed's ready, a lot of time it's going to explode with the seed all over the place. So there's a little vi video there that you can, you can watch. Um, if you're thinking about embarking on seed collecting activities, we encourage you to keep good records of the time it takes you to make collections and what your end results are. And that's data that really is lacking out there. Um, for us, uh, historically, all of our collections have been for research and conservational purposes. And it's something that unfortunately we really never did a lot of timing with because you know money wasn't really an issue. You know, uh, we're, we're looking to make small collections. But the data presented on this slide comes from a study in Northeastern Ontario where the authors showed uh, the number of seed collected per hour by one person. And I think this is really valuable information. And you can see uh, balsam poplar, which is the only of the, one of the spring seeders on this list, you know, they were able to collect up to a million seed in one hour of time. So that's really good information to have. And any information that you can share with us to help fill out some of these graphs that we can share along to other collectors would be really, really nice to have. Something else that's uh, really important uh, for all of our seed collecting is field labeling. And again, we encourage you to label the outside of the bag, label a tag and put it inside the bag. And then at the end of the day, having a spreadsheet, a summary sheet that you can have to provide with the nursery going forward. So seed lot registration is extremely important and it's becoming more and more important. Um, our forest industries and policymakers and reclamation industry, they already do this because they know that they have to use appropriate seed. If they don't, it costs money and it also lowers survival and growth rates. And part of the 2B Billion Tree Program is all about using the right seed from the right location to be planted back to the right location. And for that to happen, you need to have good documentation of where your seed came from. Otherwise, it might be immiscible into the program. Good. So um, another reoccurring theme with all of our seed collection is to reduction of moisture. And there's two simple rules for all of our orthodox seed collections. You need to start reducing, reducing humidity and temperature as quickly as possible. For the spring seeders, this is even more important because you have to think all of these spring seeders, there's, you know, they were fertilized, the seed developed, they dropped from the ground, they want to germinate right now. Soon as they hit the ground and the temperature's warm and there's moisture available, they germinate. A lot of the other seed that we're going to get into, your berries and your fall, they need stratification. So biologically, they're not ready to germinate. So you have a little more time to play with them. But that is not the case with our spring seeders. Um, the only one of the spring seeders, there's always an exception to the rules, is silver maple. Silver maple is recalcitrant. And if you dried it down the way you dry down the other seed, you're gonna kill it. So in general with silver maple, the best you can hope to do is to make your collection, remove that uh, surface moisture on it, try to get it down to about 47% and hold it in a cool environment until you're ready 
to have it uh, shipped to your until you ship it to your nursery and have it grown. Um, there has been limited success uh, shown, uh, and there's a paper here referenced um, about taking uh, silver maple and actually storing it up for up to 18 months at minus three. But even then, uh, there was a drastic reduction in vigor and germination rates. So if you want to try that, you can, but just understand that you're going to have to have a lot of seed to get your desired numbers. Before you start making your spring seeding collections, you also need to have a plan on how you're going to get that seed to a processing facility. Uh, lots of things to take into account here, and they all need to be planned out for. Um, one of the biggest issues we see is overpacking of seed and not allowing for expansion of the catkins and lack of airflow leading to increased temperatures and moisture, which we all know now is very detrimental to our seed and seed quality. Uh, one of the things we're really uh, encouraging people to do, uh, you can buy these Kelsler data loggers, very inexpensive. Um, you put a data logger into your collection, you have it Bluetooth, uh, not Bluetooth, but you have it uh, Wi-Fi or whatever to your phone. So any collections you make, you can actually track from the time you collected all the way until the time it's processed, what's ha what happened to it. And this is really gonna help you with troubleshooting. Like where, like was there a time in shipping when all of a sudden moisture levels and humidity and temperature rose? Or maybe you send it to a, a seed processing facility and it sat there for two or three weeks uh, before it got processed. And all that's gonna let you know, okay, seed quality's going down, seed quality's going down. Um, I know Alberta Seed Matters, uh, they recommend uh, shipping within three days after you make the collection to the extraction facilities to have it laid out and dried. Um, and then you have uh, in Alberta, Northern Alberta, you have 10 to 14 days um, after that time to get it all cleaned and processed uh, and stored. But relative humidity values in Alberta in May are like 20 to 45% maybe. But other part of Canada, including here in Fredericton, we can get humidity levels as high as 70, 80%. So we find that from the time we make our collection in the field, we really need to have that seed cleaned and processed five to seven days. Otherwise, our germination rates start to really start to drop. So for, yeah, for extraction from um, our, the <laughs> so we're gonna call this fluff for today, but, um, for extraction of the seed from our willows and uh, poplars, you can really treat them pretty much the same, but the process is basically the same, is that you're gonna have your seed, you're gonna have airflow pushing down through that seed. So again, this is a sort of our setup here. So after the catkins have opened up, you have a great fluff, we put into a tumbler. The tumbler is going at about uh, 45 revolutions per minute, and we have uh, moist, or oh, sorry, dry air from a hair dryer and a shop vac blowing at it. And with that process in about 45 minutes, we can dry a whole batch of seed down and have the seed extracted. So again, in this tumbler, there's a, a shelf underneath that we pull out and we can bring our seed out front. So uh, really kind of, um, but there are other innovations. I know that uh, out at Nate, uh, Northern Alberta Institute of Technology, they have something similar, but it's set up in a cement mixer. So again, there's all kinds of uh, different types of um, equipment out there, but the important part is getting it done quickly. So as we went over in the first seminar, there's a wide range of tools and equipment that can be used to increase purity. Um, and increase in purity is extremely important to the growers. We need to get rid of all the impurities and that would include bits of dust and debris. It would include things like damaged seed. Um, so we use a wide range of sieves and cloth bags and air column se separators. And again, we provide, we can provide information on all this. Um, the most important thing though, is getting rid of all of this impurities and trying to get down to a nice clean uh, seed lot, which is extremely important to our nurseries um, because all those impurities add up to time and money for them by putting impurities into seed cells and thinking that it's seed, okay? So we really wanna have nice, clean seed. Um, 
And again, it's very important that you work with your nurseries. So again, so currently in BC, they're, they're looking for 87% purity uh, for their current seed lots. Um, but that's again, working with most of the conifer seeds. Um, we also need to work with our nurseries because there's a lot of different types of seed that we just can't get to that purity. Um, and there's a, another, um, this is the same study from Northeastern Ontario, where again, using low tech equipment, and this is for a study looking at mine site reclamation. Again, there are certain species, including pos uh, balsam poplar, they were able to get down to 100% purity. So again, if you're providing a nursery with 100% seed, then there's a good chance you might be able to convince them to single or at the very most double seed each cell. But once you get into the, even the, you know, uh, 97 to 94, they're gonna want a double seed. And once you get below 90, we're talking about triple and the lower you go down, you might end up in a situation where nurseries are gonna to need to use five or six seed or maybe even more per cell because empty cells take space and it costs them money. So it's something that you really have to be uh, careful and considering. Good. So I'm getting a little bit lost here in my notes and stuff, <laughs> but this is um, um, for maximizing seed storage potential. So one of the things we want to reestablish is that all the species we talked about today, except for silver maple, you can store them long term. And long term, you know, we're talking at least 10 to 14 years, as long as you're using good processes and timing. Um, you have to be super organized. And what this chart is showing here, again, if you can get your seed collected, processed, uh, and stored, where you get your moisture content down around that 7%, or if you're using ERH, it would be an ERH sort of between 0 0.02 and 0 0.01. If you can get your seed into this range, then you can expect to get 14 years at least storage capacity for all of our spring seeders. Each step is uh, extremely uh, important in getting good high quality seed. And that goes from the time you collect your seed, it goes to how you handle it once you collect it, it's the extraction, it's the drying down, and then it's that storing. Um, and again, this is a really brief, we're quickly running through this, but all this information is available in more depth than we can provide it to you. A um, Couple of last slides, and this is again, more things that you should be thinking about for planning ahead. And the example we're using here is uh, red maple. So again, say you want to, for this year, I'm planning to go 100,000 red maple, and you're going out making collections. So we already said, if it's a good seed year, maybe you should be thinking at least three years ahead. So in this example, we're gonna say, let's collect enough red maple for 100,000 seed a year for the next three years, meaning you need about 300,000 seed. So some of the things you really have to be thinking about on top of that, because if you go out and just make a collection of 300,000 seed, and think you're gonna have 300,000 seed, you're gonna be surprised. Um, so again, uh, saleable seedlings. Every seedling that germinates, or every seed that germinates is not going to develop into a good healthy seedling that can be used. So right off the bat, you're gonna lose about 20%. We already talked about in the, maple, in the maples that it's double Samara, and one of those Samara you have to think is probably empty. So you just lost 50% there. So we can provide this table, but the point is to get about 100,000 seed a year or 300,000 for three a year, that um, you actually need about uh, 20, sorry, 17, 20 liter pails. Uh, so that's about 342 liters of fresh seed from red maple to get you that 300,000. And for every species, it's gonna be a little different, but you still gotta be thinking long-term and what that, uh, that means. So again, in, in the two billion tree program, I will say this, hopefully it's okay. I know there was a slogan that started, it was two billion trees starts with two billion seed. That has been changed. Um, that is not the case. It's estimated that about 11 billion seed is actually gonna be need to support the program going forward. Just two more slides I hear. Um, so again, although we're here for knowledge exchange to support the two billion trees, we also wanna just let you know that our mandate 
is to have the genetic diversity of our forest, trees, and shrubs um, in situ conservation. That's, that's our manual, our conservation mandate. So if you're listening to this presentation, you're involved in tubular trees um, or not, and you want to help us meet our goals, please reach out to us. We're always open for collaboration and working with you to meet uh, the conservation goals of the country. And just one last thing, again, regionally, we know that uh, depending on what region you're in, there's different level supports and infrastructure available to assist you. And we're really here to uh, fill in those gaps, but maybe we're just here to point you in the direction because if there's already people there to support you in your region, then that's gonna be the, the first avenue and first place we send you. Um, but a couple of other things, um, if you're heading out to the field and you're really not sure of what you're doing, if you're looking for, if you let us know, you can, uh, we can set it up that you can document with real time text to picture or through iNaturalist. And we can have some, one of our staff members sort of walk you through and let you know what we're seeing from your photos. Uh, and then we can actually help you, you know, maybe do a cut test in the field to let you know what we're seeing. The other thing we can do is, again, I mentioned earlier is that we can customize collection calendars for your area. So it'll give you a better idea of when you should be looking for certain species. So that kind of wraps things up. We just have another uh, set of polling questions here for you. And the first one is, you know, what kind of sites do you expect to be collecting from this year? And I do want to say, please make sure before you do any collections that you look into the regulations from your areas, what permits do you need before you start making collections? Good. And then the second is, what are the biggest bottlenecks that you're seeing uh, in your region? Or what are those bottlenecks that are going to inhibit you from making the collections or that you perceive? While you're filling that out, I just want to thank everyone because I know this is a very busy time of the year. Um, that's where we're trying to make these seminars. If we were to go in, in great detail, this would be a two or a three hour workshop at a minimum. Um, but again, we are here to provide you with any information that we have available to us. Um, and if you have questions, you know, reach out at any time. Yeah, so that's interesting. Labor, contractors, training, infrastructure, seed availability. Yep, there's a, <laughs> it looks like there's a lot of, a lot of potential bottlenecks. And those are things we'll be, you know, hopefully working with you to resolve some of those. Good. So just a last couple of slides, and I really have to replace my bad hair day picture here. But uh, you met Bernie earlier, and Melissa's been on the line. But we also have Naren Hay and Mary Knockwood, who are in charge of our Indigenous Seed uh, Strategy in our program. Uh, Kieran Volk is part of our Knowledge Mobilization Team. Roger and Matt are special projects with our team, but also fill in our field staff. Uh, Katie runs our lab, and then Jacob and Lindsay are our two main lab technicians and field technicians. And with that, we'll put up, uh, open things up for question period. And this is just a list of references from material that we drew for this presentation today. So thank you very much. So if anyone has questions, they can uh, type them in the Q&A tab, which is right next to the chat tab uh, on the bottom of your screen. Um, we had a couple of them come in during the presentation, so we'll start with those. Uh, the first question comes from uh, Storm. It is, in regard to the sampling guidelines and genetic diversity, climatically different sites, would you consider upland versus floodplain silver maple to be genetically different? Would their growing conditions impact their seed production? Yeah, so I'll take a stab at that first storm. So when we're making collections, uh, we generally use eco districts and we, um, again, there's a lot of genetic work being done on our industrial forest species, but for a lot of other species, unless it's a species at risk, there hasn't been a lot of genetic work done. So in lieu of that, we try to make our collections based on eco districts. And, you know, our thought process is that uh, within an eco district, normally your climate, your soils, and your humidity factors are generally about the same. And that's sort of what dictates an eco district. And if we're collection within that eco district, 
that, that we should be good as far as genetic diversity is concerned. But at the same time, if you're noticing uh, a lot of variability in those sites in, within your eco district, I'd say it absolutely makes uh, sense to make collections and maybe to keep those separate. Um, if you are making you know, riverbed collections as opposed to upland collections for a species like silver maple, it might be a good time to, to keep those separate and see what the results are down the road. And that's where being able to trace back to that individual, like your good records of where the seed came and having that traceability to go back to know where that seed came from is really gonna be helpful. And that's one of the issues um, or problems right now is a lot of the seed, except for the seed that's available uh, through our forest and reclamation industries, it's not geo-referenced. So it's hard to tell. And that's something that we're really encouraging through this program to do. The uh, next question comes from Ryan and it's, would a food dehydrator work for drying seeds or do you think it would get too warm? So I, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and that's where data loggers really come in handy. Um, I, I can't say we've used food dehydrators. I don't know if Melissa or Bernie have any experience with that, but um, it, it's fairly rapid, right? With a food dehydrator, so you really have to be careful because if you over dry your seed, uh, you're also killing them, right? The, um, there's one unit that I've used on a limited basis only because the temperature control was good, but I did back it up with a data logger because it would run about 10 degrees warmer than the dial said. So you can use it. I would not advise using it on willow and poplar because you will just blow them all over your room. <laughs> But for, for other species that don't shatter, um, it can be useful to, I'd say, a limited degree. Because if you can keep them below, there's a, some, a manual like the Woody Plant Seed Manual for certain species, there are temperature recommendations in there for opening certain things. But Bernie would know as well that we use more of a, a lab grade oven if we need to kiln something open. Most of the spring species though, you uh, natural air drying would probably be best, getting them spread thin. Bernie, do you agree? Uh, yeah, the um, uh, I, I just saw the comment there, 70 degrees, that's uh, way too warm, I think. Um, one thing about drying, um, whether it be the seed or um, the, 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 the freshly collected seed or the seed themselves is the relative humidity in the building. Um, can't stress that enough. Uh, I remember trying to process some poplar and um, the catkins were ripe. They were they were dehissing, um, but we couldn't get them to open. It was because the relative humidity. We, we didn't have um, humidity control at the time. And no matter how long we applied that uh, hair dryer and uh, shop vac to them, they just wouldn't open. And it was because of high relative humidity. So relative humidity, if you're going to be processing poplars, willows in an area where uh, the air is moist, um, that I think would be a, a requirement. Or you just wait for those drier days and sometimes you don't get them for a while. Yeah, and that was, that was why on the one slide, Donnie emphasized having a dehumidifier set up. Even a home, home grade dehumidifier in a room can be much more beneficial than I'd say even a, I'd rank a dehumidifier ahead of um, a food dehydrator if you had to buy something. Excellent. Yeah, that was a great question. Uh, the next one is from Jesse. It is, what would you guys recommend for collecting from those big survivor white elms that are too tall for a bucket truck, or in some cases, even to easily throw a rope around a branch? Would that be a case where laying out a tarp and collecting over multiple days makes sense? Yeah, I think, um... So again, we use a slingshot for getting those real high branches, but I do, I do know um, it can be tough, but I know with a, with a good slingshot, and that's something we can provide uh, the information on where you purchase one of those, um, you can get ropes up over, you know, 90, 100 feet and shake the branches, but, you know, conditions have to be pretty good to be shaking branches from that height and actually be able to uh, catch the seed. Um, 
yeah, I don't know. It's um, we haven't spent a lot of time. I know uh, a lot of the ash or elm collections that were done were done before my time here. We haven't done any in the last five years, but Bernie might be might have some ideas. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't think we're we collected in any of the trees that you're that you're talking about there. We we had access to a boom truck at the time, and we used that extensively. Uh, but elm is a problem just because of how they how they grow, and the foliage is usually fairly high up. Uh, every once in a while, you're going to get an open tree that's going to have some branches that are accessible. But yeah, that's that's a concern, and. Um, just wait, trying to catch some on a tarp. Um, those winged seed, if there's any kind of a breeze at all, uh, they're going to fly away. And if there's no breeze, uh, they're not going to come off that easily unless you can put a rope on them and start shaking. So it, it would be uh, probably a lot of work unless it's a tree that you really, really want to collect from. Okay, next question from Mary. If I wanted to collect red maple and germinate it this spring, should it go directly from the tree to a moist peat, or is there a step in between? You want me to take yeah. that one, Donnie? Sure. <laughs> uh, part of that whole maturing process, the seed have got to dry before uh, they're going to germinate. Um, red maple is one of those species that's really neat because uh, way south in their range, like in, in Georgia, they, they act very much like uh, silver maple, and they will germinate uh, that same spring. Um, and to the point that um, you can't freeze them and store them like we do with the red maple here. So there's a lot of uh, genetic variability across the range. Um, the other issue with um, red maple um, is that the seed are somewhat dormant. I, I think I remember about two months of uh, cold strat before they'll uh, before you can put them to germinate. So um, you could do it, but you would be really really hard pressed to try to plant them that same year. So it, and if that's the case, you're you're better off holding them for a little bit and and doing a spring plant. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, Christian asks, are there any benefits to collect seeds outside of the ideal collection times? What would be the issues arising from collecting seeds on late summer or fall, for example? Well, first of all, for your spring seeders, there won't be any seed to collect um, in the late summer fall on those. So again, um, again, this year presentation was really just on those, the populous uh, silver maple, red maple, and elm, and the willows. And those are the ones that are, you know, they're gonna be ready here in the next few weeks. Um, the other maples, like our sugar maple, our mountain maple, um, you know, in most, the vast majority of our seed, they're not ripe at this time of the year. It is the fall, so you will be waiting. And it's the same idea then, and we'll be talking about in upcoming seminars, is that you still have to wait to the right. So you just, species identification is really important. Um, to know what you're collecting from <clears throat> and then waiting until they are right for those, those color indicators. The issue is, is you, you really can't wait too long if seed is still on the tree. So an example would be ash. Um, a lot of the green ash, um, the seed is probably ripe by the end of September, but a lot of times it hangs on right until December and sometimes January. So there's no problem. That's just a natural process. It's drying out. When you think of the temperature at that time of the year, temperatures are dropping, which is good. Humidity is dropping, which is good. So the seed is naturally drying um, in its natural environment. So yeah, I think the only problem there is that you're, the longer it's on the trees, the more chance that you know, you're gonna lose it to birds, more chance for parasites and stuff to get into the seed. And then overall, the Samaras and stuff start to rot. So you might get more uh, moles and fungus uh, and have issues with your seed the longer you leave it out in, in nature after it's ripe. Uh, another question for Mary. Do the Kestrel and ETEC unit do the same job or each have different purposes? I'll let Melissa take that one. <laughs> I was hoping somebody would ask about that. Um, yeah, so Mary, I've 
I got the XTech unit first. I was trying to replicate um, some of what the Millennium Seed Bank in Europe does with some low tech stuff. I was looking for units that had reasonable accuracy um, and low cost. And then I bought the Kestrel one second. And um, the, the benefit to the Kestrel units is that, I know Donnie just was <laughs> was saying about the technology, they do work on Bluetooth. Um, so that you can connect to your phone. So if they're locked in something, you can log them without opening. So for example, Kristen in the chat was mentioning, we, we do have like a little mini desiccator pail that we do use sometimes, or we've been experimenting with. And the nice part is you don't have to open the bucket and introduce more humidity. You can do the monitoring um, without, without having to look. And they do work through some pretty thick materials. And um, the XTech unit, the only thing I found with it is, I mean, you do have to make an, your own version of a lid and have a little seal. It's a little bit more complicated to build. The Kestrels are very simple. They're plug and play and uh, they data log. The XTech does not data log for you. So if you want a record of, and you can set, there's a lot of different options with the Kestrel. You can set it to log every two hours, every tw 12 hours, and it works on easily replaceable batteries. So I definitely recommend the Kestrel for folks now versus an XTech type setup, but X techs are useful in nurseries um, as a as a stationary tool. Hopefully that answers your question. And yeah, we have we have all of the different units that we have, including our our most expensive lab versions that we do our um, water activity measurements on. Uh, we have all of that listed in our in some of our equipment lists that we handed out in the first webinar. So if anybody's interested in that, let us know and we can resend those. Thank you very much. Uh, this question comes from the person with the coolest name so far, anonymous attendee, uh, is, can you talk a bit more about access to markets for these seeds? How are collectors connecting with buyers for the seeds? Well, that is a good question. And it's one that I don't know if any of us have the answer at this point. So one of the things, um, again, with the two billion trees, as I mentioned, is that in the original call for whole and proposal, seed collecting really wasn't, it wasn't uh, called for yet. Um, but as I said, we're hoping and we're, indications are that there might be a call for proposal coming out. But currently, if you're a seed collector, um, <laughs> I'm kind of stumped as how you do maintain access. So I would say, uh, the first is to contact your province, uh, your provincial seed centers, because I know that people and nurseries that are looking for seed a lot of times. So like for us in general here at the National Tree Seed Center, we get dozens and dozens of uh, requests every year for seed from seed nurseries because they can't find seed. So um, I think, yeah, I hope a buyer soon. There we go. See, there's it. It's coming to our seminars and we're just linking people up. But th that is one of the issues, again, is how do we develop a system where people who want to become involved in seed collecting, first of all, that they can make a good living doing it for that windows of opportunities for collections, but then how do they find a market for their seed? And that's one of the things that I think the 2 billion through three program as it develops is going to have to you know it's going to be part of it because there are going to be nurseries looking for seed collectors and seed in their local areas i don't know if anyone else wanted to make a comment on that i was oh sorry i was typing um i was gonna say i can unmute someone if anybody wants to speak up about seed purchasing And yes, Derek, I'm going to find you a link for the Kestrel unit and mute myself. While we're <clears throat> waiting for that, we have another question um, from Ryan. Are there any all-inclusive textbooks available for seed viability, harvest times, dry times, et cetera? Everything that was on the one slide. <laughs> um, there's... So in the US, a lot of people compare it. The Woody Plant Seed Manual is a lot of people's Bible. It's a free PDF online. It is US based. Um, there's no perfect national equivalent of that in Canada. We are gathering as many resources as we can. Um, and uh, the best ones, some of the best ones that we can suggest are complementary to those and also um, specific to certain provinces so that they're a lot more local and include more data that's northern range edge than perhaps the us one but we will 
we can definitely provide a few more links in those. We've been giving a tons of 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 um, yeah URLs to people that want to look at something. So I think it's if you ask a more specific species question, we can help with that. Yeah, that's one of the things that we've been working on for the last four or five years, because there really isn't a Canadian equivalent at the all in one book. So we have been working with our knowledge mobilization group and Bernie, his team, and putting together tech notes that are specific to species. So trying to get all the information that we can for a particular species from all the resources available to us into one sort of tech note, and then booster that with our own lab experiences and the experiences of you know our provincial counterparts and day to day providers. I'll um, I'll just add a little bit there on seed viability. Uh, you can improve seed viability a lot by paying attention when you're collecting and having a close look at what you're collecting. Uh, there's usually indicators there of whether the seed are going to be good or not, um, like cut tests to have a look, see if there's any uh, insects or disease um, on the cones or on the, on, on the fruit. Um, so if you're collecting material that looks good, and you you cut and they're they're nice and firm inside. Uh, you're likely going to get good viability as long as you collect it at the right time and you took care of your seed. Um, it's it's that complicated and that simple, I think. Uh, before we answer the last question uh, that we have right now, uh, I just wanted to. Uh, remind everyone that if they want to hear about upcoming seminars or find out more uh, about different training opportunities that we offer, uh, please sign up for our newsletter. Uh, I'm posting the link to it in our chat right now. Uh, and with that, you'll be able to uh, get any information that the National Tree Seed Center is up to. Uh, it's very easy. You just fill out three lines, click four buttons, and you're in. Um, one question uh, is from Oliver, and he asks, are there any volunteer opportunities for new seed collecting enthusiasts in New Brunswick? Yeah, so Oliver, I think that uh, is a question that we could probably, if you reached out, we could have a conversation. And again, one of the things, um, and I think one of the maps we showed that I mean, there's always gaps. I mean, our overall goal is to have uh, seed collected and in our conservation collection from each species that native, each tree and tree, yeah, each tree and shrub species that naturally occurs in Canada. So there's close to 700 uh, tree and shrub species. And then to have collections from each eco district. And the reason we're looking for that is that, you know, with natural disasters and catastrophes and forests, insects and pests and invasives, that you never know what the next species is that could be in danger. And currently all we've been doing is reacting. So we've been reacting to butternut canker, we react to uh, Dutch elm disease, to emerald ash borer, to hemlock woolly adelgia, to mountain pine beetle, trying to get the genetic diversity of those species from the infected areas into conservation so that when the problem resides, at least we have the genetic diversity of those species in conservation to uh, come up with a, a reestablishment or conservation program going forward. Uh, but we have tons and tons of gaps. So no matter what region of the country you're in, if you are looking at making you know, volunteer collections and helping us out, then we are interested in working with you. But we want to make sure that you're doing it you know, under the right regulations, with the right certification, um, you're not, you're collecting from, you know, the right spots with, uh, you know, not on uh, trespassing. So we can't take responsibility for that unless we work directly with you and have conversations. So I encourage anyone to reach out um, and send us an email. And uh, if you're interested and we can sort of walk you through it. Thank you for that question, Oliver. Uh, next question is from Tina. Do you work only with tree and shrub species or other plants? Yeah, so our mandate is tree and shrubs. And one of the things, again, our evolving mandate, it started off with just trees. And then with the signing up the Convention of Forest Biodiversity and Species of Risk Act, we kind of moved into shrubs. Um, we do work with uh, with Parks Canada and certain conservation groups 
on other species of concern. Um, and so basically, if there's nowhere else for organizations to turn to and seed collection is a viable strategy for conservation purposes, then yes, we are open. We're also, um, again, Naren and Mary, on my screen, they're to the up and down on me. But again, as I mentioned, they're part of our Indigenous Seed Program, which we just launched in March. And one of the things, again, we're look, uh, looking to work with Indigenous communities, not just on species that are of concern to us, but what's of concern to them. And, you know, we're hoping the foundation of that is going to be in trees and shrubs, but we also understand there's going to be other species that come up and we're willing to work with those communities to uh, meet their needs on those. So hopefully that answers your question. Do Mary and Aaron have anything to add to that maybe? If they would like. Sorry, unmute. Um, yes, I mean, we're, we're reaching out and, and, uh, and, um, making contact with uh, individuals, organizations, um, umbrella organizations, communities um, that uh, indigenous communities to to talk about uh, their their I guess goals and interests in terms of collecting seed. Um, in some cases, it's uh, it's focused on on restoration work. In some cases, it's it's really about food safety and and. Uh, food safety in their community and, and ensuring that some of the traditional plants that they, they use for, for food and for medicinal purpose, purposes are, are available now and into the future. Um, so if, you, if you're interested at all in, in talking about, uh, about the Indigenous Seed Collection Program or you have a, a contact um, who you think might be interest, please, interested, please feel free to pass on uh, our contact information. Um, you can reach us through the National Tree Seed Center, um, or you can uh, reach, uh, you can reach uh, us through my email, and I'll put that in the chat in case anybody wants that. Thank you, Naren. Oh, and Mary too. I just want to kind of um, speak to Heather Charles's uh, message. She said that uh, birch and black ash would be an example of um, that is uh, a very important uh, black ash is a very important species to most indigenous communities in the east. Um, birch, um, we um, had Melissa uh, Labrador on the call here a little while ago, and she was saying the same thing as well because her and her dad are actually canoe makers, and they've been actually sharing. Um, um, that practice in um, several uh, of Parks Canada's um, having a sessions and building one canoe. One was in PEI a couple of years ago and last year was in Ketchum Kujik down in Nova Scotia. So um, yeah, we're trying to be as inclusive because of the fact that um, when we're looking at um, the forest and sea collection, it's in a holistic sense, as opposed to just being um, looking at it um, monoculturally. So we're trying to push that kind of sense for it as well. So, yeah. Thank you, Mary. Uh, how are we looking for time? Should we keep on answering questions? Let's go another uh, till quarter after. Okay, that's okay. Perfect. Daniel asks, would it be possible for the Federal Seed Center to set up a forum for seed collectors and seed requesters, like a Kijiji for seed? So it's, um, I'm smiling at that because um, back in 2017, we, ju we just finished uh, our seed uh, survey that Melissa was running for us, along with our collaborators, um, um, Accenture and Wilder Climate Solutions, who were partnering with us on um, that survey. It just closed. Uh, I know Melissa and the team, I know Kieran was involved, are, are still making follow-up calls. But my point is that when we first got our funding to start investigating doing a seed supply survey for Canada, you know, that's how I actually envisioned it. I thought that the National Tree Seed Center, you know, one of our roles might be to sort of be a database with collectors and buyers, a place that people could come. Um, and I don't know. I really don't know if that is, is the role that we should be playing, but it's definitely something that's in the back of my mind that, you know, I think that it's lacking currently. And, you know, there are a lot of people who are interested in seed collecting, 
Um, but they don't necessarily where their seed would go. Like I want to seed collect, I know it's a great year. I have the tools, I have the desire, but if I make the collections, what am I going to do with the seed? And they don't always have a buyer. So, you know, I, I think it's a great question. And I think it's something that, you know, needs to be set up and coordinated for the country. Anyone else have any comments on that? Um, yes, I will add that it's been batted around in a in a number of different organizations in different contexts. And I think just to support what Donnie's saying, I, I think that there's just, I think one of the big holes that's missing in certain places in the country, not in all parts of, of the country, because for forest tree seed, there's some really well-organized um, groups in Alberta and BC, um, but for certain sectors and certain regions, um, the coordinating the coordinating of that takes up a lot of resources. I don't know if everyone appreciates in some cases, and it I mean it does add cost and time. Um, so we will try and get our you know if you let us know what region you're in, we will try our best right now to connect you to the best um, seed organization that can help you with buyers. But again, we are we are kind of lacking that at a national scale that there is no Kijiji for seed and outside of legislated uh, reforestation. Um, there's just a lot more, you know, you can call it looser rules or flexibility, one of the two. Um, and that, you know, organizing that takes up a lot of time and effort. Um, one good tool I would suggest that we found in reviewing uh, what we were doing for the national survey was to look at the BC NLA, like the Nursery Landscape Association has a plant search function there. And whomever is growing native species from seed in BC, that's a really great tool to connect you directly to we know who is propagating it. So that's just one example of something I've seen that, um, and I've talked to the person who organizes that, and I mean, you can, she does a lot of work to, to make that happen every year, but it is the kind of tool I think you're, you're talking about, Daniel. I think just a follow up on that, sorry, uh, is that, you know, a Kijiji, as long as it's a local Kijiji, because what we don't want to have the seed collected in Fredericton, New Brunswick, all of a sudden being shipped to, you know, Northern Quebec or British Columbia, because that is opposite to what the program is about. That would be collecting the right seed, maybe from the right species and then planting it in a totally inappropriate region. So if that were to be set up again, it's you really need, can't stress enough is that, um, you know, going forward um, is being able to source where your seed came from is going to be so important. And just an example, I mentioned it last presentation was, you know, the city of uh, Toronto came out with uh, documentations recently that they are going to start looking for seed source for all of their urban plantations. And that's something that hasn't happened. It hasn't happened in North America that I know of where an actual large urban entity is saying, no, seed source is important. We're not just going to take seed from anywhere and plant it out. We want to know where our seed's coming from because we want it to be appropriate. Because again, it costs money. For every seedling or sapling you plant that's from an inappropriate seed source, the chances of that surviving diminishes greatly. Griffin asks, can nurseries still provide seedlings to 2 billion tree projects? Is there a process to sign up? What do I do to talk about being a supplier of trees slash shrubs? I think the 2 billion tree program would be very happy uh, to know that there's still nurseries out there that are not part and are interested in becoming part of the program. And um, I think the simplest thing to do is actually just type in uh, look for the Two Billion Tree website. Um, if you can't find something there, then again, reach back out to us again, and we can put you in contact or put the Two Billion Tree program in contact with you. Um, I know, again, the call proposals for nurseries and for large landholders and stuff has already uh, happened this year, but I think there really is a bottleneck in uh, nurseries uh, and nursery capacity to meet the demands of the program. So we said we were gonna to go to 3.15. We have one minute left if anybody has a, a final question. If not, any questions that um, maybe you didn't have a chance to type it in or you're thinking afterwards, again, uh, you can email us the question, we will answer it and then we can provide it back because any question is a good question and whatever you ask, it might be uh, important to others.
I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat or in our Q&A tab. Um, there might have been, there's some good comments talking about uh, planting the right seeds in the right place. I'm not sure if we wanna touch on that very quickly because uh, it seems like it's an active question uh, thread right now. Okay. Well, I think we're good at this moment. And again, um, you know, our next seminar is on June 7th focusing on harvesting berry crops. And we can continue dialogue because a lot of these questions, uh, they're pertinent right across for the entire uh, realm of species uh, where we're making seed collections from. All right. Slides will be available. We'll have a follow-up email coming uh, uh, soon. And that will include slides, some supporting documents, and a link to the uh, recording uh, and the links to the previous recordings as well. So if you came late, you can still access it. Uh, and there will also be a uh, slide translation in French too. Remind everyone to sign up for the newsletter as you're exiting so you can get more information. Okay. Well, thank you very much.